waterfall environment. And while much of the software world recognizes the need to transition to Agile methods, it's more difficult in some places than others. So today's webinar will be describing the basics of Kanban and how you can fit it in on top of an existing workflow in a way that leads to quicker delivery and higher quality. Our presenter today is Alan Shalloway. He is the founder and CEO of NetObjectives. He's got a number of years of experience in the software industry and is an industry thought leader. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Alan. Hi, thanks so much. I'm very excited about being here today. Uh, I think this is a very uh, both interesting, germane, and, and useful topic to today's world. Um, a little bit about us and our background is we actually work on transitions of large organizations and, and include the business side, management side, and team, creating lean enterprise. And those are some of the books we've written, so we kind of have a fairly broad experience as, as well. And I've kind of already been introduced, so I'm just kind of going to skip this a little bit. You might notice that email address, though, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, alshallotnetobjectives.com. Uh, this is going to be our agenda for the day. And before I go through this, I actually do want to give a special thanks to David Anderson, and, and he's the really one who inspired this talk. First of all, those of you who don't know David Anderson, he's actually the creator of, of the Kanban uh, software method. But more particular to today's talk, uh, at the uh, UK Lean conference uh, that he and I were at last year, I was at a Extreme Tuesday Club meeting, and uh, David did a talk about how you start Kanban, where how you can start wherever you want to be or wherever you are, and um, uh, this talk is basically inspired from that. So I wanted to acknowledge him for that. Also, uh, later uh, a couple months ago in January, we had David come into our organization and do his uh, Kanban coaching, basically to strengthen our our own staff's abilities in coaching and training in Kanban. And that's when I really got clear that it wasn't a coincidence or just a characteristic of Kanban that you could start it wherever you are. That's something I knew, but he'd actually designed it that way. So as we learn about Kanban, and I'll be introducing that, it's interesting to note uh, that, that the whole methodology is based on this easy transition. So I'll be talking quite a lot about that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to say, well, you know, why don't we just go to Agile? Hey, if it's good, why don't we do it? And uh, well, we'll talk about that a little bit. What is Kanban at a, at a high level? We'll talk about flow of work and why we have to manage the entire value stream and how to use the value stream and basically then end with how to start with Kanban, which is what the seminar is about. I've just got to kind of <coughs> build up to that to get a better understanding of what Kanban is, what it allows, and um, you know both the challenges and opportunities to it. So anyway, again, this Agile's got just like Hillary Stilbert. I think it kind of sums up why some companies are going to Agile. <laughs> But that's not really why. It's not just about doing things more efficiently. It's really about adding value. Now, I'm going to just give a quick two-minute overview of Scrum, even though that's not what this talk is about, because Scrum is sometimes actually associated with agility. Uh, it's very popular. Uh, it's right now, I'd say, the most per current popular uh, software or agile method there. And basically, it works and is often thought of as the definitive of, of, of Agile methods, is you have this list of prioritized features. You have some product owner uh, manage these, prioritize them, size them, and then basically give them to a team. And the team will commit from those features to smaller pieces of them called stories. These are subsets of the features, different ways of building it. And they commit to this over a certain time period. It works on them, validates that they built them right with the stories, and then either delivers it or shows that it's at least deliverable quality. It may not be enough to make a difference to deliver, but you hopefully can deliver it. If you can't, you at least have something you can show, and you just keep going through this process. At the end of every two weeks or four weeks or whatever your iteration is, you have an, a retrospection of the iteration. And this enables you to deliver value on a regular basis. Uh, the idea of this is you get better business value quicker, teams get to focus on things, you get higher feedback to see how you're going. It's really great. Uh, and it's when it, when it works, it's extremely effective. Uh, the idea, it's, it's really based on three simple things. You've got your product owner that prioritizes. You've got the scrum master. That's the team facilitator, coaches the team. And you have the team. Those are the three roles. You have a release planning, a sprint planning, and a daily stand-up are the three meetings. The artifacts are the product backlog. Um, 
the uh, sprint backlog. Product backlog is the whole thing that has to be built. The sprint backlog is what you've committed to. And then you have different uh, burn up and burn down charts to show where you are. And three daily questions, you know, how have I, what have I done, what am I going to do, and what's in my way. And there are a bunch of roles. But it's a very simple, lightweight framework that's easy to start with in certain situations. And in some situations, it's not. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But the ideas basically flow. You know, you have this plan. Those, those are like things on the upper left are like our, our, our features that we're going to do. We plan in an incremental way. What are we going to do? We then do it over the, uh, over the two-week period, if that's our, our, our sprint length. We then check where we are, we act, and we kind of continue this up every two weeks improving. So again, why don't we go to Agile if it's so great? And uh, you know, sometimes it's just a little overwhelming is, is part of it. It just sometimes is, you know, we're, we're already overworked. That's why we're trying to, uh, to improve. Uh, people tend to improve when there's either pain or there's an absolute necessity to improve. So if you're already in kind of an overflowed state, overloaded state, sometimes the last thing you want to do is add something new that you have to do. Um, and, and that's one reason. Uh, another reason, though, is sometimes just too much change is not such a good idea. And in some organizations, it's very difficult to change to an agile situation. Uh, Scrum kind of assumes that you already have a team or that you can get teams. But in fact, in a lot of organizations, uh, teams don't, well, they sort of exist, but somebody is really on five teams. You know, if you're working on five different projects with different sets of people, say if you're an analyst and you're, being, you're helping five other projects going on, you're not really on a team. Or if you are on a team, but you're working on several different things as they come up, then you're on a team sort of. Um, so in a lot of organizations, the fact that you don't really have teams, it would be fairly dramatic to, uh, to uh, you know, have that take place. Sometimes you have staff that are uh, very essential and, and kind of constraining, not because they're bad or have bad motives, but they're the only ones who know how things work. You know, we sometimes think about people as having certain skills and abilities, and that's definitely true. But people also have domain knowledge. They have certain uh, understanding of legacy code. And sometimes this makes them, for all practical purposes, uh, irreplaceable and, and extremely um, constraining. So if you, again, have one person who's needed to give input on five different teams because of legacy constraints, uh, it's very difficult to say, oh, let's have teams and, and Ralph will go over on this team because all of a sudden he's not available on other teams. So, so there are a variety of issues sometimes that, that make it so it's really difficult to start and just create teams and, and move forward that way. So in these situations, what do you do? And that's really, that's really where uh, Kanban can be very useful. Okay, so I've used the term Kanban several times. I haven't said what it is. So let me give it to you in a nutshell. The notion of Kanban is basically based on the theory of flow that comes from, from Link Software, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that. But let me just give you a little, a little story that can illustrate it. So uh, again, also uh, promoting David a little bit here, he's writing a book uh, that will be coming out, I guess, later this year on Kanban. I recommend it. And I mention that because actually in the book he tells a story that I also had the experience of, and that's what makes me think about it. I was in the... Uh, Oops, sorry about that. I was in the uh, in Tokyo two, three years ago, and I I was staying next to the uh, Imperial Gardens. And as we walked in, my wife and I walked into the Imperial Gardens. There were two gentlemen there, and one of them uh, gave us each a little white card on it, and uh, just a little you know a lot of plastic thing. And on one side it said, "Please return to attendant." Uh, on leaving, and on the other side, it had something in Japanese that I assume was the same thing. And th that's it. They they really didn't say anything. They didn't charge us anything. They just handed us these things, very you know, pl nodded politely, and and uh, that was it. And of course, when we left, we handed them back. And you can say, well, what was the purpose of the, them giving us these little white cards, uh, tokens that really didn't cost us anything? Nothing happened. Well, the reason they were doing this is they were actually limiting the number of people in the park in, in a very simple way. They basically had, I don't really know how many, but say a 1,000. There were about five, six different places down in the gardens. And you can imagine that at the start of the day, they give, if they have five and they want to limit it to 1,000, they could have each of the stations have 200 of these cards. 
Now, it's not exactly precise. It's possible people are going to want to try to come in more from one angle or the other, or need leave from one angle or the other. But more or less, if they follow this convention, uh, you will have about no more than 1,000 people in the park because, or in the gardens, because if there's not a token to give, nobody can come in. So this is really the notion when we talk about limiting things with a Kanban card. That's really what Kanban is meaning here. It's this card that says, I've got availability of work. This is basically how Kanban works. So we still have this prioritized list of features. Uh, now in this sense, so these aren't features like just a little story. Each one of the things here is something that can actually be released. This is the idea. This is actually one difference between uh, Kanban and Scrum. In Kanban, you have what's put on the input queue for the development team is actually something releasable. In Scrum, very often they're working from just a backlog of features, and they decide when they release it uh, by working with a product owner. But in Kanban, basically what goes on the input queue is a releasable piece. So this could be a big chunk like you have in Waterfall. Uh, it, it's usually better to make it smaller, but that's maybe step two. So anyway, the team works on them. They, they break them down into stories. They follow in principles, and they get it to come out. And then they deliver value again. Each one of these things coming out is basically one of those features that's releasable coming in. Again, you could Kanban is intended to, to work on maybe smaller things coming in that are what we would call the minimum marketable feature, the smallest thing that adds value and can be marketed. But that's another issue. The way Kanban works is working on things and limiting the work in progress to be more efficient. We'll talk a little bit more about this as I go as well. So there's no iteration like we had before. There's not that let's commit to two weeks at a time. It's rather just a flow-based building system. It takes a systemic view. This is based on lean. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, you can think of lean. A lot of people think of it as coming from Toyota. but uh, because that's where the book, The Machine That Changed the World, The Story of Lean Production came from. But Lean actually has other, other people have come at basically what Toyota has done in manufacturing. They've come at it from other angles, uh, not really from just through Toyota. So I like to think of Lean basically as saying it's based on three or four main things. One is we believe in the people doing the work know most about the work. This is sometimes called respecting people. There's also this systemic view. In other words, when things go wrong, we want to look at the system. We want to see what's wrong with how we're working, not what's wrong with our people. Again, another kind of respecting people. So such as if we, if we can't talk to customers very well, what impact is that going to have on us rather than how do we talk to customers better is maybe a way of thinking about it. We want to limit the work in progress because if we have more things going on than we can readily deal with. That actually slows us down. It actually creates additional work by working on multiple things, just because it delays things from when we discover an error until we can solve it actually makes extra work. So, so this is kind of a problematic yeah, issue. Uh, we create visibility and maintain it so everybody can see what's going on. And we can actually start where you are. This is very important. See, this is really the biggest difference in my mind between Scrum and Kanban is in Scrum, you have to create these teams. And sometimes if you have organizational problems that's inhibiting you from doing that, Scrum says, well, just do it, but it gives you a little insight other than it's an important thing to do. It gives you a little insight in how to do it. So uh, Kanban, on the other hand, says, look, start where you are so it's less chaotic, it's easy to start where you are. But it creates tension on improvement by saying, look at your work in progress, look at your flow. So it actually still gives you guidance on how to improve, but it does it in a more orderly way and gives you insights and gives you insights in how to do it. And I like order in the sense, or I like the smoother transition, because when you try to transition too quickly, people tend to panic. People tend to get nervous. People tend to not be as effective. People tend to be afraid, and it's just much harder. So being able to transition from where you are to where you want to be uh, in a way that's smoother without a lot of drama and, uh, and fear is just a, a whole lot better. So what we want to think about is, is uh, software as, as flow. Uh, in other words, I start out at the beginning and I get, I get some ideas and then it eventually gets built and then it eventually gets deployed. I'm thinking about that anything that slows me down, like, like slowing a flow down in a stream is not a good thing that it causes delays. And let's look at this a little graphically. So 
we have this notion in software that, well, the customers are either originating the ideas or out of the interaction between the customer and the business end, you know, our coordinators, product champions, product owners. We create this list of capabilities. So you can see the capabilities in the, uh, over here. So we have the ideas generating somewhere between these conversations. We come up with these capabilities we want. We give them to the development system. They eventually come back to the customer. So we have this flow <coughs> through the customers, the business side, and the development side. In lean management's role, if you're wondering why is management not up here, management's actually very critical, but management is actually about managing this value stream. How do we get this flow? Again, this isn't to talk about managing value streams right now, so I'm not going to go through that yet. But so you have the role of the customer, the business development, and management making this value stream flowing all the way around here work well. Now there are a couple of things we tend to focus on. Sometimes we focus on like in Agile, we think about, oh, I've got to get the development team to be Agile. I've got to get the developers to build things in two-week increments. But in fact, what we really want is business agility. What we really want is the ideas from a customer, any customer of the organization, to be able to go through the entire development cycle as quickly as possible, except when I say any idea, obviously we want to do the most important ones. We want to size them and prioritize them more. This is what I mean by product portfolio management. This is something clearly outside of the, outside of the uh, domain of the development team. This is something like I put it on the business end. It's they have to decide which are the most important features, which are the most important things as a business across all my products are most important, and how do I do this product portfolio management, basically. Now, the concept here in Waterfall is basically if you might do yearly planning and you have this really big plan and you say these are the things we're going to do, in a Waterfall environment, that's kind of what you're trying to address. In Agile, what you're saying is we want to be able to uh, build things smaller and deliver them smaller uh, so we can, in fact, always prioritize the most important things sooner, get this, the right size things out faster. That's our intention. But there's something to actually observe here as well, that if I manage here uh, in terms of the capabilities, that managing what I'm giving my teams can have an absolutely very big impact over here. Because uh, if I overwhelm teams, have them work on several things at once, then that's going to, I mean, even if they can work efficiently, which they often can't because there's a lot of task switching and all that, but even if they can work efficiently, you're going to delay the time from start to end of the project simply because, at best, working on three things at once of the same size will take you three times as longer. But you'll notice I say this induced waste. By this I mean there's an interesting phenomenon in the software field, which is that if I am a developer and I write a bug, but I don't know about it yet, and you tell me about it like that afternoon, I probably will fix it very quickly. But if my testing group is working on three things at once and they don't get to it for two weeks, and you tell me two weeks later, even if nothing else has changed, it's not going to take me just a few minutes to kind of get back into it. It usually takes significantly longer. But of course, if I'm working on three things and everybody else is working on three things, there's a really good chance a lot of stuff has changed. And it's going to take a lot longer. And we've all had this experience. So much so, we even most people say they spend most of their time fixing bugs in the development arena. This is actually because of what I will call induced work. In other words, these delays have created additional work for us to do. So if we can work on less stuff at any one time so we can get something completed, then we'll do better. So even if we're doing kind of waterfall planning, the idea is how do I get something onto a team and get it to work better? How do I get there? And you know, part of what's going to guide us here Again, part of the work in progress notion is to make an interesting distinction between queuing and capacity utilization, productivity, throughput, things of that nature. For example, let's say you're outside of a bank and you see all these people walking in and all these people walking out. And you say, man, that bank must be efficient. Look at all those people walking in, all those people walking out. And then you walk into the bank and there's this huge line. I tell you what, better example, <coughs> Disney World. <laughs> I mean, they get people through those rides tremendously, but how long do you have to wait? So just being productive, just having throughput is not necessarily what we're looking for. We don't want to be very proud of an organization that can, that can build something in 30 days, but it had to wait on the queue for a year, 
That's kind of what we're talking about. Some of this happens because we're overloading teams. We're giving them so many things that they, they just can't get it all done because they're working on three, four, five, ten things at once. This is where, again, we have to pay, pay attention to, to the bigger picture of things. Um, and and that's, that's, what I'm, that's, that's actually what we mean by flow. So how do we improve flow while we start where we are? How do we do that? So the first thing we need to do is get some visibility into it. So here, <coughs> I've got what I'd call a, this is a, a simple value stream map of something that actually is fairly, looks a little bit like a waterfall. Uh, you can think of it as a flow chart. It is actually, but it's a flow chart where we're looking at time. So you'll see we have a request, approve, requirement, sign off analysis, design, review, code, test, deploy. Those are the steps we're doing. This is not meant to be like this is Kanban. This is just an example of how some team might be doing their work today if I were to map it out. And you'll see there are three numbers, kind of three different kinds of numbers here, like on the, let's look at the requirements. That's kind of interesting. There's 60 hours value in the box. That means, and there's 160 hours underneath it. That's like a four weeks, you know, 40 hours a week. So that means over four weeks I worked on average 60 hours on this. Why only 60? I wasn't vacationing. I was, whoever was doing this was work, probably working on two things at once and then had some other overhead. So I'm working 60 hours over, one, over a four-week period. Before I got requirements, things were approved, but they'd wait for a couple of weeks before they'd get to requirements because why? People, well, they were working on something else and they had to get through. By the time the requirements were done, we waited eight weeks for sign-off. So what you've got here is a mapping of where I'm spending my time. And in fact, you can create what's called a process cycle efficiency where the time worked, which would be reading left, right, 0.5 for request, 0.1 for approval, 60 for requirements, 1 for sign-off, 40 for analysis, is 509 hours. But the calendar time is 3,433 hours, or 14.9% efficiency. Now, of course, people are busy working. I mean, if you were to do this, you know, maybe you'd have five other projects, and this whole thing would be around 90%. You know, people are busy. There's not a question of people busy. The question is, from the time of start to end, it's taking you a year and three quarters, but only about 15% of the time is on this project. So the question is, what would happen if we could kind of squeeze this in? What if we could kind of shorten the time period? That's, that's something we'll look at in a couple minutes. But this is basically what we mean by value stream map, is that uh, we will <coughs> we're mapping how value is added. You can also notice those loopbacks, by the way. Uh, and technically, I'm actually just measuring this as how many hours of work. The actual value time added would be lower because the rejects and working back isn't really considered value add because you're, you're removing defects you've put in. But that's another point. Don't need to go there. So, <clears throat> so we're looking at this mapping of time. And this is what's called a value stream map. And value streams can be extremely valuable uh, because they give, us this, they give us this big picture of things that we often don't see. Uh, I'll give an example of something that I did, oh, I don't know, three, four years ago now when I first started teaching Lane Software where we did a value stream map and uh, we had the, uh, in the course, and a couple people, the director of, of software development and the manager of the project managers was there. And they were there because they knew they had a development problem. And when they mapped their value stream map, it looked kind of like this. They had, a, they had a few sales steps and a few development steps and a few deployment steps. Development and deployment are in blue because it was the same group doing those. And what they found was that about 20% of the time they had this loopback from deployment to development because when they installed uh, the application, they were building sophisticated websites for their clients, so they would eventually install it on the, on the client machine. When they did that, they would find problems, and they would have to, the development team would have to basically go back on site and fix it. And uh, you know, this quality problem was severe because you can imagine what that did to the follow-on uh, project that these guys worked on. So they were coming to this lean stuff to find out, hey, how can we help? And uh, it was clearly a development problem because obviously, you know, it was, the systems were failing and all this. Uh, that's why they had development people there. But when we did this value stream map, what, one of the things you do is you t there's a tool that we recommend called Five Whys. You know, you say, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Et cetera. And when they mapped it out and they saw that loop back, instead of just saying, oh, it's because of a quality problem, which was the answer they had coming in, they actually did some analysis and say, okay, why is the, why is the system failing at the client site? 
Well, it's failing at the client side because the client side is not configured properly. Okay, well, why is it not configured properly? Well, because the clients didn't run the configuration program we asked. Okay, well, why didn't they run the configuration program they didn't ask? Well, the client didn't know they were supposed to. Well, why didn't the client know they weren't supposed to? Uh, because sales didn't make it clear that they were supposed to. Well, why didn't sales make it clear they weren't supposed to? Uh, because when sales was talking to them, once the client said they were going to buy the system, sales did what any good salesperson does when the client wants to buy it, they shut up. And they just buried it kind of in the contract that you will run configurations uh, to make sure your system is set up right and all this. And that was actually the real root cause. I mean, okay, better quality might have solved the problem, but just running the configuration programs, which was much easier and cheaper, would have solved it as well. So there are a couple points here. Uh, one point is, is that the development team was impacted by somewhere else. So sometimes, again, when you say let's create teams and let's do Agile at the team level, you might be missing the whole point. You've got to look at the bigger view. Uh, so anyway, they actually did go back and they talked to sales, and sales, made it, sales figured out a way to make it as a positive to tell the, develop, the uh, customers to run the uh, to run you know, the configuration program, saying, hey, you know, you run these things will work better and we won't charge you for it, and then we'll schedule your install. So that actually solved the problem. Agile, as it's often practiced, again, just starting with the team is here, and that's often not what you want to do. We want to take this full, lean view. So whatever we start, we want to make sure the whole thing is there. And this brings up this question of, well, where do we start? At the team, the business, product portfolio management, or technical practices. We have to somehow make a complete view of this or we may not actually get the result we want. Now, this highlights something that's rampant in the industry today. And this is actually by Ken Schwaber, one of the co-creators of Scrum, that a lot of organizations using Scrum will succeed in getting the benefits they hope for from it. And I would suggest some of that is because you have to look at the entire value stream and not just assume it's the team. Or you have to recognize that sometimes you just cannot force Agile in an organization and say, hey, here's your impediment, fix it. But you have to give them a way to transition from where they are to where they want to be. And I think that's very critical. So let's step back for a second and look at this and say, well, which is actually easier, working faster or avoiding delays? See, in other words, in that diagram I showed you before, let's come back to this, where I have request approval. See, I can say, let's do code faster. Let's not have it take 80 hours. Let's have it take 40 hours. Okay? But see, that won't really change that 34, 33 a lot. Okay, maybe that 280 will go down to 200 if I cut 80 down, or maybe even it'll go, maybe it'll even go 40 to 1 over 40. But it's not changing the cycle time. That does nothing to do to those delays in between. So what we want to do is say, instead of trying to focus on doing what we're doing faster, let's see if we can eliminate the delays between the steps. In other words, imagine if we still had to spend 509 hours, but we can do it over a 2,000-hour period. But my suggestion would be this. If somehow if you could squeeze the front end, let people focus on what they're working. In other words, if I could somehow shorten that 3,400 hours down to 2,000, I would suggest that 500 hours would actually go down as well because you'd have less induced waste. This is the key point to really get, is that if we can remove delays between steps by avoiding working on multiple things at once, whatever we're doing will become more efficient. And if we do this on the existing organization structure we have, we can achieve success by making continuous improvement. So what we want to focus on is the overall time, which is also business agility, which means we're in target, on target, on focus for what we're trying to accomplish. And we want to use Kanban to eliminate delays and by managing our work in progress. And this is going to improve our quality and lower cost. It improves quality because we'll make less errors if we, if we find them faster and can, can improve our communications and, and uh, fix them quicker, uh, it'll lower our cost because actually we'll be spending less time on reworking and fixing. Okay. So Kanban is based on this theory of flow. I'm going to show you a little bit about Kanban now, a little bit more in detail than I have. It's really based on this idea of I'm going to eliminate delays to improve my quality and lower cost. Um, critical delays are, are some of these, like time from getting information. In other words, in a waterfall environment, if we have everything planned out up front and we just work on everything at once, then uh, we have these really big batches. And of course, if it takes us a year from getting information until we use it, the longer that is that information degrades. We have to get it 
refreshed or we have to uh, or we have to redo it. If I'm working on five projects at once and my testing is delayed, then if I make an error, I, I'll take longer f to tell the developer. If I start, if I get talking to a customer and then I, if I get talking to a customer and then I don't get feedback from them for a long time, again, I'm going to have longer misunderstandings with them. So what we want to do as a manager work in progress to help remove these delays. So in a sense, if you want to be still kind of pure waterfall, you could still say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work on one major project at a time, get it done, and then go on to something else, get it done. But there is actually some benefit to trying to cut things up as well. So we can do both of these if we want. So let's, let's take that value stream map I showed before. And I took part of it. And I, I put, took part of it here, and I've kind of mapped it out. Now here I've actually, uh, I've got MVS. Uh, I guess I've used these terms interchangeably at times. Minimum marketable features or minimum viable features are kind of the same things. In other words, what we're saying is I'm going to give the development team, however I've planned it from the big point of view, I'm going to actually give it to the team uh, in, these, in these chunks of I can release this piece. So I might still do my analysis, you know, design code test, but I'm giving the, the minimum thing I can give that I can release. They go, each of these columns represents a staged activity. I can refine it. And then that ready for development means that's a queue. That's why I've got a little queue there. This is waiting to be worked on. Then I can do analysis, and I'm ready for design. Then I do design, and I'm ready for code. Then I code, ready to test, testing, done. So it's kind of like that same map, only instead of a square, what I've got is I've got uh, I've got a column, and those stickies are just meant to represent work in progress. In fact, here's the map. And I've, I'm showing in blue that part that I've kind of mapped up here. You'll see I'm not actually, uh, I guess those left two columns are, are, would represent some of that work that I, I've got not in blue that the product manager does. But what I've got here on the, in the blue section is the mapping that the team is doing. So that's what a Kanban board would look like. It shows each of the different, each of the different things there. Now, in the real world, however, the Kanban board wouldn't look like I had, but it would look maybe something like this. In other words, I'd have a backlog, a jam for development. I'd have maybe a jam in testing. Uh, there would be some large queues here because typically as you work on things now, they typically as you work on things now, they don't really, they don't really, it doesn't really flow through smoothly. We have queues and delays and things of, of that nature. So if we start with Kanban, with our existing flow, one of the things we should be doing is we should be asking ourselves, well, OK, how do I smooth this out? Well, obviously, I've got a lot of stuff waiting for testing. I've got a lot of stuff waiting to be developed. So how do I, so I need to put a little more pressure, I guess, on the developer, on the, uh, the product manager side, saying don't, don't overload the team. But on the testing side, I've got to figure out why is testing backed up. And one of the experiences we've seen is the reason testing is backed up is because there's nothing that ties devs and tests together. Devs get to go off and build code, and if there's a bug, well, they, they don't know about it yet. They just keep writing more code. Also, devs and tests aren't in complete understanding of what the customer wants. So one of the things we've found when you have some phenomenon like this is to do something called acceptance test-driven development which is basically you, can, you, you don't have to write your test first, but you at least define them with the, the customer, the developer, and the QA person all together. So you're just basically changing or adding a new step. It's actually not adding a new step. You're already doing this. At some point, devs do ask themselves, what do I need to know? How will I know this is working? What do I need to test to make sure this thing is working? Testers ask the same question, by the way. And in fact, customers actually when they are reviewing it, they'll ask, Gee, how do I know this is working? Oh, let me give them a case. Uh, try this. Does this do? Does it do this? What's funny is we typically do these all separately. And uh, if we do them all up front at the same time with each other, we get on the same page. So acceptance test-driven development doesn't really take any extra work. It actually is just a reorganization of when you do it. Again, Kanban talks about time, as Lean does. And uh, it's, we're just saying I can look and see where my bottleneck is. If it was in the ready to test, it's something we would recommend. And you can now say, oh, I'm going to change my process a little bit. 
I'm going to use Kanban this way, and now what I'll do is by defining my test, you'll actually see this typically happens. We've had extremely high success uh, with acceptance test driven development with our clients. Um, I had actually, a couple months ago, I was at a client where I was giving some coaching to a team I hadn't worked with, and, and the QA person there said, you know, you were at another training earlier with some other, other team, and somebody told me about this acceptance test driven development thing, and we just decided to start moving acceptance tests up to the front. And we had our best sprint ever, you know, just by, by attending to this notion that getting everybody on the same page. I mean, she may not have totally understood it was this flow underneath it all, but she definitely understood that things got better because everybody was on the same page. So this is really important. So this is basically a little bit more of Kanban in action. Okay, now the question is how do you get started? Because I kind of jumped around and this talk is how do I get started where we are? But I wanted to make sure that we understood that what we're talking about is we're taking the same flow that we have now. We can take the same people and the same organizational structure we have now. We're not forcing a reorganization of the company to get teams. Uh, we are suggesting that better product portfolio management would be a big help, uh, but you could do this even without that, although we'll see how we get, what we're about to do will improve this as well. So how do you get started? Well, there's actually kind of a nine-step process. And again, you'll notice I've mentioned Dave Anderson in an Extreme Tuesday Club meeting that I first saw him talk about this. First thing is you uh, are going to begin where you are, but you're going to agree to goals. In other words, you get the stakeholders and the team uh, and management together and you say, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, and, and you talk about, obviously, we're building software and, and you, you agree to what the intention is. What are we trying to maximize? How are we trying to be productive? We need to map the value stream. So I've shown you an example of value stream. If you're wondering why, now you know, because you need to build one of these. You need to see where you are. You need to see where you start, how you do your work, and how you finish. And understanding of this makes a, uh, makes a big difference. Okay, after you do that, you define a set of work items. So some work items could be stories these, or features. These could be things. This will be an enhancement. You know, this will be... Uh, a, a new product. This is a bug fix. Whatever it is, just define what the different work item are, work item types are. You need to be with external stakeholders of the team. So you need to talk about what are your work in progress limits. So you can have conversations like this. David actually, I remember, talked about when when some team was being overloaded, and he asked the product manager. He says, "Well, uh, well, you got the product manager and the development manager in the room." And uh, the, uh, he asked the development manager, how many, how, many, how many things are you working on right now? How many different features are you doing? How many different uh, uh, things does product management have you? And they said about 12. And uh, so David asked the product manager, I said, does that sound right? Does that sound like uh, that's the right number? <laughs> does that sound like too many? Um, and he said, yeah, that probably is too many. So they actually talked about this, like, like what's the right number to be giving the team? How many different things should they be working on? Uh, and that's what we mean by whip limits. This is a high-end whip limit. In, in the diagram I showed you, the Kanban board, it was kind of a little bit more detailed. But there's this high-end work-in-progress limit from the stakeholder's point of view. How many different things are they working on? Uh, and then internally, there's a whip limit as to each step. Now, we don't have iterations in Kanban, but obviously it's not just, it's not going to just work things going in at some point to come out. We have what we call an input cadence and a delivery cadence. So an input cadence says how often will people, well the shareholders, stakeholders, excuse me, uh, give stuff to the team or put it on their queue. How often will the team deliver and demonstrate what they've done? So that's what I mean by cadence. So it could be every couple weeks something comes in, it could be every couple weeks the team shows what they've done. It could be every four weeks. It's whatever is agreed to. There's also classes of service. So classes of service is different than types of work. Class of service could be uh, this is a regulatory item. It has to be done by this state. Or uh, this is a uh, we have this stakeholder who's just like they're they're like they're like our number one client. They they get priority over anything. You know whatever it is. Different types of service very important. Otherwise it's very difficult to manage the request. Okay. There's also a cycle cadence for each of these class of services. So like a number one escalation might be something you say, I'll prioritize and bump this up to the top of the queue. Now, this is 
probably following rules you already have, but we're just defining them to create visibility and understanding of what's going on. Okay, after this, we have to create a board for tracking. It could be manual or electronic. Uh, electronics are absolutely essential when you've got uh, when you've got uh, uh, you know remote people in different places, distributed teams, things of that nature. And they, they, they go from very lightweight, like an Excel sheet, to high quality, like version 1 systems. Uh, you, you then have these other steps I've just kind of lumped together. You agree to some sort of stand-up, so every day the team can review where they are. You have some sort of operational review of, uh, of how, how the Kanban board is working, how is the, uh, the product managers talking to the teams, how is the whole flow going. You've got to educate the team in this, and you've got to start doing it. But this is basically the steps. Now, when I describe this to people, sometimes people say, well, that sounds like waterfall. I'm doing analysis, design, code, and test. And the answer is, well, sort of, but not really. There are some differences, actually significant differences. First of all, even though you can start where you are, Kanban is going to force you to go into smaller batches of work. Uh, it's, first of all, s suggesting to the product managers that a product portfolio management would enable the teams to be more efficient. And it also enables them to be more effective because it gets them to focus on the minimal thing they can deliver to the customers that would be useful. This enables them to prioritize better. But it enables people to start where they are. It also means that, by the way, if you, when I've talked about starting where you are, again, the structure doesn't require teams. It also means I can have somebody who's shared across Kanban boards working on different things. So I manage my work in progress by saying, hey, look, if this guy is really critical, he's the only one who knows how his legacy code works. See, putting more and more and more stuff for him to do is, is, is not necessarily helping him. It's actually making him less efficient. So in looking at the Kanban board, what, by looking at flow, if, if I'm somebody who's uh, got something to do on the team and I see, well, gee, I've got this huge backlog here. I've got my work in progress, and I'm not supposed to go beyond it. When we talk about managing work in progress, it means you set on how much I can have, and you don't go beyond that amount. Then I'm not allowed to give this guy something else. I've got to figure out <coughs> either how to help him or how to get something else done. And this focus on smooth flow is what enables the, each of the individual steps to be more efficient because they're, they're being less overloaded. It actually creates this tension for improvement because I can see where I'm overloaded. Uh, if a step has 10 things waiting in front of it and I've got a whip limit of five, then obviously I'm well exceeded that I shouldn't have gone here. It makes me ask, how can I improve flow, not how can I make people busy? Of course, we never say it that way. We say, how can I make people productive? But just getting people to be productive and getting something done, if it's actually adding a delay, will actually make things slower. So it's a focus on delivery of business. How do I deliver business value quickly? That's really what, what we're focusing on. OK. So this is really just kind of a taste. So you know, I'm going to let questions through. I think uh, some of them being, being answered as I've been talking. And actually, I'm going to put one other slide up here, too, because for those of you who are with a PMI, you can get a P, PDU for this. So here's the information for that. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to invite you to uh, register at netobjectives.com. Here's the URL for that. Um, with uh, where you can get more webinars and more information and things of that type. But uh, I'm going to really pause here for questions. I kind of went through things a little faster so I could have some time to answer questions. Uh, so please let me see them. Thank you, Alan, for, for that. And then, um, yes, we do have quite a few oh, questions. questions. I'm so. looking at the wrong place. I am sorry. <laughs> no problem. And uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, as Alan's answering those, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. OK, great. Yeah, I just, OK, here we go. Great. Lots of questions. Oh, I like this. OK. Can Combine be used with conventional uh, for projects scheduled like CPM or PERT in Foresight? Um, Not quite sure what you mean by that. You mean can you use Kanban where you have time delays? Can can you re really ask that question? I'm not totally clear. Okay, can you explain the notion of the iterations as it applies to Kanban? 
It sounds like a recipe for a waterfall SDLC. Okay. Well, the thing is, in a waterfall SDLC, it, it is it is still how you're flowing your work analysis, design, code, and test. But in waterfall, the philosophy is you're batching things up. And the philosophy is how do we get everybody at every step to be as efficient as possible. In Kanban, you still are doing the same work. By the way, in XP, you still do analysis, design, code, and test. Even test-driven development is you're using tests to do your analysis, which is brilliant. I mean, I like XP. I love XP. But what you're really doing is you're always doing analysis first. You're always figuring out what you want. The question is, how do you do it? Do I use a test definition to do it? So people, when they see analysis, design, code, and test, say, oh, that's like waterfall because they do analysis, design, code, and test. And I would say, no, in fact, I think everything does that. The difference is, is that in Kanban, what you're saying is instead of focusing on having every step of the way be as productive as possible, the lean insight is that what I want to do is look at the flow. So if what I have is, if what I have is uh, uh, my testers are overwhelmed with work, instead of trying to, instead of saying, well, testers are overwhelmed, the developers got to go work on something else while they're waiting for the testers, which would be the normal way, the work in progress limits on the testers. In other words, if you say I got five testers and they can only test at most eight things at once, so a couple can be blocked or three things can be blocked then what happens is the developers aren't allowed to actually write more code and wait for testers because that would exceed the web limits. So what you have to do then is maybe the developers help with tests. This actually tends to shorten the, the uh, cycle time, the time from, from idea to end. So the difference is, is the kind of tension that's created. But it is evolutionary in implementation. Uh, but that's really the key, the key point to it. By the way, uh, when I get a question, if you're not satisfied with my answer or have another question, please ask it. I, I do the best I can, but the, I can always misinterpret what was, what was meant. Do you suggest any time spent on estimation, or do you plan by hours only? Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm not, if I'm planning by hours, then that would be estimation, it seems to me. Kanban, I, some, some Kanban people actually believe estimation isn't that necessary if you're just letting things flow through the system. In a sense, estimation isn't necessary to get work efficient. But in, in enterprise engagements, which is what our company does a lot of, you need some high-level estimation to just do some level of planning. So yeah, we believe in estimation. We actually like team estimation typically more than planning poker because it's faster, seems to get just as good a job done in a fourth of time. And there are ways to, uh, to modify it or, or to have conversations that planning poker is useful for. Estimates aren't just about the time or the, t the estimate. It's also about the conversations and make sure you don't have disconnects. Um, and again, on our website, you can, you can see things like that. Um, so uh, that that's, uh, hopefully is answering the question. Uh, actually, I just realized I had these alphabetical. I'm going to put them now by time. Uh, OK, so how does this work for software package that has run locally for 300 plus locations nationwide that requires at least two months of testing prior to release. Well, say you need to do that. So look at how you're doing it. Try to shorten times. The more time you can shorten between steps, the faster it'll be. So however you're doing it now, set up the value stream. Look to see how things are being handed from one thing to another. There is a flow of work. Where are you introducing delays that aren't really giving you any benefit? They typically cause you pain. So this works by creating visibility into the by creating visibility into the delays that are taking place. Okay. Okay. Can Kanban be used with conventional? Okay, that's one I still didn't understand. Okay. How do you decide whether Scrum to be followed or Kanban? Actually, uh, I would suggest that if you have well-defined teams, and uh, if they can operate as somewhat independent units, then Scrum's pretty good. Uh, however, you still want to manage your work in progress limits. So something like Scrum Bond typically I find is always better than the Scrum, but it takes a little more knowledge. Uh, and I would actually, there's an article on our website, uh, or you could just Google this, uh, where to begin an Agile, where to begin an Agile and put my name in, something I wrote for the Agile Journal uh, a few months ago that talks about this difference. We also have webinars on depicting the right process. Uh, Personally, I think you always want to pay attention to flow no matter what. OK. Yes, this webinar was recorded. You'll have to check with version 1 and our site layer to see how it will be available. 
How does a project manager determine release plans and dates using Kanban? Uh, that's fairly long conversation, but basically you make high-level estimates. The thing with Kanban is it will actually give you better predictability because you can actually start seeing with this class of service, you can see how quickly things flow through the system. People talk about estimation, and they always talk about, well, what's the complexity of the work? They talk about planning. Okay, we're going to take this complexity of work, make an estimate, and then figure out how long it'll take people to do. But there's a very large variable there that people tend to forget, and that variable is how busy are people. So if I give a piece of work to a team, and this is all they're working on, they might get it done in a couple of weeks. If I give it to a team and they're working on four other things, it won't be 10 weeks. It won't be five times the amount. It will be much worse than that because of the induced work. So by focusing on teams doing one thing at a time, this variability and the efficiency of the team goes down tremendously. And it actually increases, uh, it increases, the, uh, you know, the, it increases the, the predictability of what's going on. Now as far as uh, release plans and dates, the, this really takes a higher view than, than just typically we talk about at the Scrum, we're dealing with a team. And then, you know, the question is, how do you do a release plan even across all different products? I'm going to have to rec refer you to uh, our book, Lean Agile Software Development, Achieving uh, Enterprise Agility. If you look on our website, I'm not sure if that, if you look at our website and click resources, uh, you'll see the book listed on the left. About half that book is online. I'm not sure if that chapter that talks about enterprise release planning is. Uh, but I'll make this offer to everybody here on the website because I put this out on our, I mean on the webinar, I put this out on our own website. It's still active. Uh, is if you're someone who's responsible for 100 or more people, uh, send me an email. We have a book giveaway. That book actually, we're trying to promote the idea of how you do this high level view and planning and we think we deal with it very well. So shoot me a note about that and I'll send you a free copy. Uh, what are the top books you would recommend on this topic? Uh, I think the best book right now on Kanban is uh, a book by uh, Corey Lattice called Scrumbon, where he actually talks about how to transition people from Scrum to Kanban, and it's kind of a cross between the two. Uh, if you go to, uh, uh, there, there are any number of sites, if you, Henrik Nieberg and David Joyce, if you go to the Lean SSC, that's leansc.org, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, body of knowledge portal that has a lot of reference to information uh, about Kanban and Scrum. There are not that many books on it yet. Uh, the, uh, like I said, David Anderson's writing a book, but it's not out yet. So I'd start with Corey Lattice's one. Uh, go to David Anderson's site, agilemanagement.net, and we have a lot of things on our own site at netobjectives.com as well. Uh, does Kanban work better for shrink wrap software products than reactive environments such as retail online? I'm not sure I've noticed the difference between the two. What I do know, though, is if you're in a support environment, Kanban is an absolute natural. Uh, we first started using Kanban in that situation ourselves because, uh, because it, it's such a natural. You don't really have iterations. You take things as they come anyway. So that, that was just a, a no-brainer for us. And then we started seeing where it was much better in other cases anyway. By the way, I'm assuming you've gotten the PDU things. I'm going to put something up here. There's just some other information as I'm answering questions, some other resources uh, as well. Okay, how does Kanban map work in progress to the individuals in each team? That is, how does Kanban keep track and avoid multitasking? Actually, it doesn't directly map to individuals unless they're themselves the constraint. Typically, you map it by work. Kanban is very much focused on the workflow. Uh, so if you had, say, five developers, you might ask yourself, how many things might I want these people working on? Well, if, if you've got five devs and you don't want them to be multitasking a lot, you might put the WIP limit at five. And maybe you put it at six so that one could be blocked, say. Uh, you might put it at three if you want to uh, force uh, pairing, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, yeah, in the flow I showed it was departmentalized. And, and it doesn't have to be that way. I was trying to take a worst case example, like a, like in Waterfall, I typically see that. Uh, Kanban teams can swarm just as well as a Scrum team can swarm. There's, a, there's no reason you have to be compartmentalized. Okay. 
So it sounds like there's a place for business process improvement skills in Kanban. How would you recommend as a career transition path? Like, I'm not sure I'm talking about the trans career transition path, but I'd say definitely there is because, see, what happens is product managers start understanding when they're overloading teams that they're actually slowing down their own work. It's not just, hey, take on one more thing because uh, we need this, which you often hear. It's rather they realize now if they take on one more thing, it's going to slow things down. By the way, any question I don't answer here, please feel free to ask me on one of those user groups. Uh, one of those user groups there. Okay. Uh, how self-organization tenets of Agile can supplement or enhance Kanban implementation? Well, Kanban is based on this notion. It's uh, Kanban, again, is based on Lean, which is based on the notion that teams understand their work better than anything else. So people, people are going to, uh, people are going to be who are doing the work are going to be the ones who figure it out. They're the ones who determine how to improve the workflow. Okay. Uh, how can you integrate your Scrum method and introduce Kanban for continuous support in the production? Uh, so we have an, AP, an app in production. A team does features development, and the same team also takes care of product support. How can you introduce the Kanban to this team? Well, this is actually introduce Scrum on. In other words, keep your iterations. But start looking at the workflow you're doing. Break it down a little more refined. Manage your work in progress. Don't let people just open stories at their own, you know, oh, well, this looks like a good story to open, or this looks like a good task to do. Try to limit the number of stories open at any one time. In other words, it's better to get a story in and get it done. And if you have features, you should always have your features associated, excuse me, you should have your stories associated with a feature. Don't open the stories for more than one feature at a time. Get that feature done. Get the stories individually done. And the idea is you stop starting and you start finishing. You focus on getting things done. Now, in the cases where you can't do anything, then maybe you open up something. But actually, that's where you should say, can I improve the process and swarm more? So basically, add work in progress to your existing Scrum. You'll then be doing Scrum bond. What you might find is that you don't need to do the two-week iterations at all. You, know, you can just do, go to a pure flow model. I've seen many teams transition from Scrum to Kanban by saying, oh, we need iterations, we want to do them, we'll just add WIP, work in progress limits. And then after they do that, they realize, oh, the well, flow works better and it's faster. So that's something you might discover. OK. Uh, Alan, I think we have time maybe for one more and okay, then uh, a quick wrap-up. OK, let me just quickly scan down here for one really good one. All these <laughs> others, please just shoot them to one of those user groups. But these are all should be the business-driven software development group or the Lean Agile user group. Um, yeah, somebody says, can you use Kanban in a project that has already begun? Yes, just see what you're doing. Pay attention to work in progress. See, this is the, I'm going to summarize it with this question. Kanban says, if you pay attention to your workflow, if you pay attention to where you're causing delays, that is much more effective than if you pay attention to how to keep someone productive all the time. Because if they're working on something that adds a delay to somebody else, they're not improving throughput. Now, what you really want are ideas in and values out. OK, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to hand this back. Please send me these questions on one of those user groups. I will make one quick distinction between the business-driven software development group and the Lean Agile user group. The Lean Agile user group is a purely open public group on Yahoo. The business-driven software development group is meant for clients,